This podcast is part of the Middle East and South Asia Initiative in the College of Sciences at the University of Central Florida. My name is Roxanne Trombetta. Our mission here is to educate, engage, and influence the international community. Today, I am joined by Dr. Gonal Tall. So the listeners are aware, Dr. Tol is the director of the Center for Turkish Studies at the Middle East Institute. She was an adjunct professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University and currently teaches at George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies. She has taught courses on Islamist movements in Western Europe, Turkey, world politics, and the Middle East. Dr. Toll spent three years of field research in Germany and the Netherlands, where she wrote on the radicalization of Mili Gurus, the Turkish Islamic, Islamist movement in Western Europe. She has written extensively on Turkey-US relations, Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy, and the Kurdish issue. She is also a columnist for The Radical, a Turkish publication. Dr. Toll, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Firstly, could you tell our listeners a little bit about your personal background and where you come from? Well, I'm from Turkey. I was born and raised in Turkey. I went to college there in, in Ankara, and I came to the United States um, a few weeks before September 11th uh, to do my PhD. Um, and uh, I was in Florida, Florida International University. Uh, and I spent several years here uh, working on identity politics. Uh, and I went to Europe to do my field research in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, and I was studying the Turkish Islamist movement, as you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, and after I completed my dissertation in 2009, I went to Washington and I joined the Middle East Institute at the time. Uh, MEI did not have a Turkey program, so I founded the, tur uh, the Turkey program, and oh. I've been there since then. Awesome. So you're the best person to be talking to about Turkish domestic politics right I now, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> which is the subject of this podcast. So just going, jumping right into it, um, in one of your articles that I read, you mentioned that the Turkish government under the AKP, or Justice and Development Party, and Erdogan, uh, have often used anti-terror laws against their political opponents. Um, you also mentioned that they're in vast control of the country's uh, media outlets. Do you believe that the government is on a path towards dictatorship? Well, uh Many say so, but I think it's Turkey is somewhere in between. Turkey is uh, something that we call a hy what we call a hybrid regime, meaning mm -hmm. that it's not a full-fledged democracy, but it's not a, a full-blown dictatorship either. There are we do st we have uh, competitive elections, which is something that you don't have in dictatorships. We have political parties. Uh, the media is 90% of, of Turkish media is controlled by the government, but we, we still have critical voices. Um, and uh, we just saw last year in 2019 uh, that elec elections and civil society still matter in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Last year, Turkey held uh, local elections. And until then, uh, many people, including myself, had resigned um, ourselves to the fact that elections do not matter in Turkey anymore, in Erdogan's mm -hmm. Turkey, because um, there have been so many problems with the elections and there were allegations of fraud um, raised by international organizations. So we made the argument that elections uh, do not matter and Turkey is, is, is on a path to becoming a, a full-blown dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the election results uh, in 2019, March 2019, challenged that assumption because uh, Erdogan and his ruling party lost almost all major cities to the opposition. Oh, wow. And that was thanks to the civil society organizations the, the opposition had mobili mobilized. Um, and, and also that tells you that, so in March 2019, we held elections and Erdogan's party lost. Uh, particularly difficult for him to digest was losing Istanbul. Istanbul is, is Turkey's um, financial capital. Uh, and it's a very important uh, city for Erdogan because he launched his political career there. So he uh, decided to cancel the elections. And uh, Turkey held another elections in Istanbul a few months uh, after, after March. And if you look at the turnout there, you would expect people not to go to the polls because mm -hmm. uh, knowing that, that it c he could cancel elections again if he loses, people you wouldn't expect people to have faith in the democratic process. But that didn't happen. So all these things tell me that 
uh, Turkish democracy is is going through a very difficult process, but it's not dead yet. It just needs mm -hmm. help. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing that the pol political efficacy there is still so strong after he can have that direct impact on the elections. But I guess my follow up question to that is. Um, um, what, what are some promising political figures that are challenging um, his long reign, 17 years, I think? Well, the current mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem mm -hmm. Imamoğlu, he was the opposition, the main opposition party is uh, the secularist party called uh, People's Republican Party, Republican People's Party, the CHP. Uh, Ekrem Imamoğlu uh, was the opposition's candidate, and he won the elections there initially, uh, it was by a very small margin in March, uh, and uh, in the in the follow-up elections, uh, the margin was even even wider. Uh, but he is now everyone is now talking about how he could become the main challenger, how he could challenge Erdogan's rule in in uh, 2023 presidential elections. Um, so he could be. He's I think he's a very important figure. But one has to keep in mind that he's not a a typical CHP politician. Uh, he comes from a, and the CHP is, is uh, it, it defines itself as a social democratic party. But Ekrem Imamoğlu comes from a center-right party. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was one of the reasons why he had a wide appeal beyond the CHP's traditional base. He is someone who is known to have come from a religious background. He can recite Quran easily, mm -hmm. uh, and and he's done so on the campaign trail. I, and I think that played a big role. So he is someone who can not only reach out to uh, the traditional secularist, westernized elite and the base, but but he can also uh, appeal to a wider audience. He can appeal to. Uh, disgruntled AKP supporters, for instance. So I think that makes him <coughs> an important figure and the potential uh, f actor who can challenge Erdogan in, in 2023. But I think he, it's, it's still, uh, we're in 2020, so uh, three years is, is a long time <coughs> in politics. And I think he now has a golden opportunity. Mm -hmm. He is uh, running Turkey's biggest city. Um, and uh, and I think he has to build a, a track record of success, because in the past uh, the CHP in main opposition as the main opposition party it wasn't considered as an effective party in terms of delivering services, reaching out to uh, to lower classes. So this is his golden opportunity. Istanbul is a big and complicated city; it has many problems. So if he delivers on his promises and if he provides good governance. I think he certainly he will be in a position to 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 challenge Erdogan. So, do you believe that um, Istanbul could be like a representation or some sort of microcosm of the whole of Turkey? So that you think that his policies that he's applied there uh, can be applicable to the rest of the nation? That's yeah. right, because Istanbul is a city. <clears throat> there are very few people who were born and raised there. It's mm -hmm. Istanbul is a city where uh, people from Anatolia uh, go there go there to live to raise their children so it's it's almost it's a, a, it's a city that reflects the, the soul of, of the mm -hmm. entire country and that's why whatever happens in Istanbul uh, says a lot about the rest of the country and in fact Erdogan has acknowledged that when he said if we lose Istanbul we will lose Turkey. So Istanbul is a very critical city. And except, uh, obviously, I mean, there is, uh, there is that component, but also there is the, uh, the, the, the point that, that Istanbul is the financial capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you control Istanbul, you control uh, those, those networks, which uh, played a very important role uh, in uh, Erdogan's uh, plan to keep himself in, in, in power. So Istanbul is, I yes. would say, it's, it's a key, uh, key city. And that is very interesting. Um, now to just go on um, another tangent here, of course we're talking about, del we're delving into Turkish politics and we can't delve into Turkish politics without talking about the Kurdish peoples. So um, some say that the most oppressed under the current um, Turkish government right now are the Kurdish peoples. Um, but what do you say to those who warrant their suppression with uh, domestic security concerns? Uh, well, t Turkey's problem has always been, uh, at the moment, Tur Turkish democracy faces many other problems. But I still think that the Kurdish issue is one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. um, that the country is facing. 
Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not optimistic uh, about the peaceful resolution of, of the issue. Um, although when Erdogan uh, came to power, shortly after he came to power, in 2005, for instance, uh, he raised hopes by saying that by acknowledging that Turkey had a Kurdish problem. Uh, and unlike many other, uh, many previous governments that came before him, he acknowledged the Kurdish question not just a matter of security and terrorism, but he also underlined the fact that this was a matter of uh, economic dis discrimination, social discrimination, and he uh, recognized that as an identity problem too. Mm -hmm. So those were, th that, that was an important moment um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, Turkish government's history of dealing with the Kurdish question. But over the years, uh, his, his uh, views, the way he sees the Kurdish issue has changed. Now he's fully in line with other uh, nationalist governments yeah. who uh, simply look at the issue from a very security perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a, that's a big mistake because this is clearly, there might have security implications, but I think those security implications are the result of uh, that political, uh, social, and economic marginalization, and mm -hmm. you have to address those aspects of the of, of the problem in order to have a peaceful resolution. Um, and another concern that many <coughs> who expect uh, this government or any Turkish government to address the issue is that Erdogan has built um, a, an alliance with ultranationalists, and that's his survival strategy. He has nowhere else to turn. He, yeah. in the past, he allied himself with with liberals, uh, with uh, with Gulenists, with different segments of of uh, of, of the country, and now uh, he really needs the nationalists to stay in power. Yes. And he also Turkey has transitioned from a parliamentary to a presidential system, and under the new system, you really you need a uh, fifty percent plus one to stay in mm -hmm. power. And that makes Erdogan dependent on this nationalist alliance. And as long as he's in alliance with the nationalists, I don't see him changing uh, his, his strategy or, or his view vis-a-vis -vis the Kurdish question. Yeah, so, so his viewpoint is not expected to shift at any time as it did before. Um, but did you notice any kind of difference in strategy or difference in the way that the insur uh, Kurdish insurgency approached the issue when they were recognized as an actual issue of Turkey, when you mentioned that Erdogan, Erdogan did it in 2005, I think. Well, there was a period, so there were several uh, openings. In 2009, uh, Erdogan uh, launched a Kurdish opening in an effort to grant more rights to the Kurds. Mm -hmm. uh, so according to the agreement that was cut then, um, the, the gov there was going to be a ceasefire, uh, and the government uh, uh, was going to address the key Kurdish demands, and the PKK was going to take steps to, to, to withdraw from Turkey. That failed, uh, mm -hmm. and I think one of the reasons it failed was it was, um, it, it was not uh, well planned. Uh, I think Turkish society was not prepared uh, in, ad in advance. So the government did not do a good job uh, of uh, um, preparing the public. Uh, and several years later, after the Syrian conflict started, Turkey launched another Kurdish opening, and that was in 2000, 2011. Um, so again, the AKP made promises that it was going to address key Kurdish demands, which is mostly about um, language rights in the few constitutional uh, changes and granting Kurds some form of decentralization. And the Kurds, the PKK, promised to withdraw from, from Turkish territory. So, so the, the process was, um, the process began, uh, the PKK started withdrawing from, from, from Turkish territory. But a few months after the process started, uh, the PKK stopped. Uh, citing, citing the government's reluctance to take the, to, to hold up its end of, uh, end of the deal. Um, so there were times when the government engaged the PKK, the PKK responded. But what is making everything so complicated at the moment is what's going on in the region. Mm -hmm. um, because 
Turkey's Kurdish question has never been a domestic uh, matter anyway. I mean, even in, in, in the 80s, in the 90s, there was always, uh, obviously, I mean, it's a transnational uh, issue given the fact that there are Kurdish communities in neighboring countries, but also uh, Turkey's neighboring countries use the, the PKK card, the Kurdish card, um, against against Turkey. So all those factors made Turkey's Kurdish issue uh, is a, 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 a regional matter. Um, and it's, it's even more so today, after mm -hmm. the, the conflict in Syria started. And that heightened Turkey's threat perception and also made Turkey's domestic Kurdish policy vulnerable to actions of actors like President uh, Assad, for instance. So this complicates the picture even more, uh, which makes a uh, which makes peaceful resolution of, mm -hmm. of the conflict uh, even more unlikely. But of course, I'm not saying that it's impossible because we are talking about a leader who has been uh, very pragmatic before. Uh, so it's all about his rule. If he can find a way uh, to, to stay in power uh, through an alliance with the Kurds, he can do that. It's, it's, uh, it, it can happen. But at the moment, I just uh, the, the Kurds in Turkey, they have some of them have supported Erdogan in the past, but now many of them feel quite alienated, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that, that Erdogan has pursued a very anti-Kurdish policy, not just in Turkey, but also in Iraq, uh, in Syria, and elsewhere in the region. So that's why the Kurdish community in, in Turkey uh, is now distant, which makes them an unlikely partner uh, mm -hmm. or ally for, for Erdogan. Yeah, and just to um, close on this, like my last final question on um, the Kurds, I when I was doing research, I just read about the brutality in Turkey of the state against the Kurds and just the kind of public shaming. Has that kind of increased, decreased? What is the trend on that since um, you mentioned that er Erdogan per is pursuing a more anti-Kurdish um, uh, policy? Well, I think it, certainly part of his, an important part of his strategy is criminalizing the legitimate Kurdish opposition. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, the pro-Kurdish HDP, many of its, uh, its uh, uh, MPs have been jailed. Their mayors have been dis uh, have been replaced uh, uh, with uh, state appointed trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, so he almost uh, he he destroyed the HDP network. So his agenda is is to criminalize the, the Kurdish opposition, and that would not only weaken the Kurdish opposition because remember the Kurds have have become a very effective opponents of Erdogan. In 2015, for instance, Turkey held par parliamentary elections. And that was a key moment for the Kurdish political movement. They captured a historic 13%, uh, yeah. which denied the ruling AKP a parliamentary majority. Uh, so that was the first instance where the Kurds uh, challenged Erdogan's rule. Uh, and again, last year, uh, during the, the local uh, elections in two March 2019 and later in June 2019, uh, the opposition managed to capture all these big major Turkish cities thanks to the support given to them by the pro-Kurdish party. Mm -hmm. An overwhelming majority, for instance, in places like Istanbul, Istanbul is the biggest, biggest Kurdish city in Turkey. Oh. So without their support, uh, the, the, the main opposition could not have won uh, the elections. Uh, so uh, by uh, criminalizing uh, the, the pro-Kurdish uh, party uh, and the Kurdish political movement in general, Erdogan is also trying to drive a wedge between mm -hmm. um, uh, the HDP and other opposition parties, which could be an effective strategy. So far, the opposition hasn't really uh, remained united. Uh, but, uh, but it's such a fragile alliance yeah. uh, between uh, the secularist party, between you have an Islamist, uh, marginal Islamist party, you have the nationalists, and then you have the Kurdish nationalists. So this is the opposition that we're talking about. It's very fragile, meaning that it's open to, it's vulnerable to Erdogan's provocations. And, and that's one of the reasons why he is, uh, he is uh, criminalizing uh, the, the Kurdish opposition. 
So do you think that, I'm just going off tangent because here it's really interesting to me that um, the opposition hasn't tried that strategy to unify themselves more um, in opposition to Erdogan, but does he make it rel he makes it relatively hard for them to do that in the first place? No, actually, he made it easy for, oh, he the, made it easy. for the opposition to, to unite because the problem of Turkish opposition has always been that there are so many different um, uh, different currents in, mm -hmm. in the opposition that it's it was really difficult for them in the past to to come together and, and unite against Erdogan. But switching to the presidential system almost forced the opposition to unite. Oh, okay. Because it's, uh, it, it forces you to form a, a coalition with mm -hmm. other parties. So under the parliamentary system, for instance, where if the AKP or any party could capture 30, 35%, we have a strange electoral system. There is a 10% electoral threshold, for instance. So if you, mm -hmm. let's say, capture 30, 35%, you hold 60, 65% of the seats in the parliament. So uh, when he was operating under the parliamentary system, he did not have to dominate, electorally mm -hmm. dominate. He didn't have to capture 50%, 51% to dominate the political scene. 30, 35% was enough. But now it's not. So. Uh, anyone who wants to rule the country has to capture 50% mm -hmm. one, which pushes the opposition to unite. So this presidential system, actually, by switching to a presidential system, uh, Erdogan uh, forced his opponents to, to unite. Yeah, which is very interesting how that was counterintuitive. But um, just moving away from internal politics, and just a final question um, um, with something that's occurring right now or developing right now in the news. Um, Turkey has committed... Um, I think it was a week or a couple weeks back with several powers to end foreign intervention in Libya in their civil war there. And I was going to ask, if you, do you believe that this can be realistically upheld? But since then, of course, there's been accusations that Turkey has remained in the area and there were reports that Syrian troops were still spotted there. Um, was this expected? Um, was the agreement ever expected to be upheld? Or? Well, it's, uh, what Turkey is trying to do in Libya is, yeah. is quite risky. If you look at it from Erdogan's perspective, for Erdogan, everything is about staying in power. Whatever mm -hmm. he's doing in the region, in Syria, in Libya, it's all about consolidating his power at home. Um, he's facing many challenges domestically, and he can't really do much to address those questions realistically, meaning he has to turn to foreign policy as a tool to galvanize his, his, uh, to, to his base. Uh, so Libya uh, it was to him is one of those tools that he can use. Uh, because he's seen in Syria, for instance, when Turkey launched a milita several military incursions in, in, in Syria, it worked in Erdogan's favor. His support jumped uh, three, four points after, after uh, Turkish military incursions. Mm -hmm. So he's seen, he's experienced in Syria that, that a military incursion really galvanizes the nationalist opposition and has this uh, rally around the flag effect, mm -hmm. and it helps his, his numbers. So he was expecting a similar outcome in Libya. But it's not really going to work because Libya, uh, when Turkish people look at Syria and Libya, Syria is, is, is important and it's almost a domestic problem given the historic uh, relations between the communities of, 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 of the two countries. And there is a Kurdish dimension there, too, given mm -hmm. that Syria has a sizable uh, Kurdish minority. And Turkey shares a long border with Syria, which makes Syria and the conflict is in Syria a big security concern for many people, particularly for those living on, on the border, in the border towns. Uh, and and there is none of that in Libya. Libya is this faraway country. Many people in Turkey don't really understand what's mm -hmm. going on or who the players are, whether the stakes are high or not. So that's why um, while uh, almost 70-80% of Turkish public supported Turkish military incursion into Syria, only 30-35% uh, approved Turkey's oh. decision to send troops, deploy troops in, in, in Libya. So the domestic dimension is, is, is quite important. But also, uh, Libya is important for several reasons for Erdogan. And I think the first, number one, is Turkey has lost a lot of money after the conflict in Libya started. Turkish construction companies had been very active, had invested heavily in, in Libya, and once the conflict started, uh, Turkey uh, lost billions of dollars in, in government contracts. Mm -hmm. So one of Erdogan's aim uh, is is to make sure to secure those contracts. And he's now, he has 
been talking to the UN supported government in Tripoli, mm -hmm. uh, which reportedly pledged that it would uh, honor those those contracts. So that's that's one of the reasons. And uh, and the second reason is uh, Libya has rich oil and gas resources, and President Erdogan several times referred to those resources as as an important uh, component of, of his strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, except uh, all those resources are held by uh, by the opposition in Libya by yeah. Haftar's General Haftar's forces, uh, and and er Erdogan is is fighting against uh, against Haftar. Uh, and and I think the third question is what's happening in Eastern Mediterranean. Eastern Mediterranean is very important for Turkey. There has been a, a, a growing competition over uh, gas drilling uh, uh, there, uh, and there is a, a, a strong anti-Turkey front there, including uh, Cyprus, Greece, uh, Egypt, uh, Israel, the United States, European countries. So Turkey has found itself quite isolated in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and uh, cultivating closer ties and signing an agreement with Libya, for instance, was seen by Ankara as a way of breaking that isolation. Mm -hmm. So now the big question is, yes, it all makes sense if you look at it from Erdogan's perspective, but will it really pay off? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a big question mark because we don't know what's going to happen. It will all depend on the trajectory of the conflict there. And he has been investing in this UN-supported uh, government but on the other hand, the international community is divided. The UN also supports the parliament in the eastern part of the country, which doesn't really recognize uh, Tripoli government that is allied with, with Turkey. So it's a very complicated situation, and, and I think that's, that's why I, I think it's, it's risky. And this is also interesting. Um, in this um, conflict, Turkey was sending Syrian troops, and I don't know if I read that right, but I wasn't sure um, what the reason was behind that, and I thought that you could elaborate on that um, aspect of it. Sure, yes, reportedly there are uh, elements of Syrian, a free Syrian army fighting there uh, on, on Turkey's behalf against Haftar's forces. Well, one reason is, again, as I mentioned, uh, Turkey's, Turkish, Turkey's decision to deploy troops there is very unpopular at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, from Erdogan's point of view, sending Turkish troops if, if one Turkish soldier dies, that's really going to challenge Erdogan's rule at home. Mm, it's going yeah. to be a big problem for him. So that's one of the reasons why he has been using uh, these, these Syrian forces. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, another question here is uh, he's undermining his own policy in Syria as well. So he is, uh, right now there's a lot of problems Erdogan is facing in Syria with Russia, with the regime, with Iran-backed forces. Uh, and he is weakening the opposition there that he has uh, so forcefully supported since the conflict in Syria started in 2011. So he's en enlisting those in his fight against uh, Haftar in Libya. So it, he's undercutting his own, uh, he's dealing a blow to his own strategy, uh, both in Syria and, and in Libya. Well, so I think um, what we've learned today was that everything is entangled with each other and that domestic politics has a um, big effect, especially in Erdogan's rule, on his foreign policy. Um, just last to wrap things up, I'm curious about any developing projects or research that you are conducting or that you have interest in and would like to share with us, or any issues that you are um, particularly interested that's developing right now? Well, I'm working on a book, uh, mm -hmm. which I feel passionately about. Uh, I know it's just my first oh. chapter. That's how you feel when you first <laughs> start writing a book. <laughs> uh, and then you hate it yeah. uh, by the time you finish it. But uh, the book is about how Turkey and Syria transformed each other. And my main mm -hmm. argument there is everything President Erdogan has done in Syria. The reaction that Turkey has given to the conflict in Syria was always about Erdogan's power struggle to consolidate his, his, his own rule at, at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but that power struggle was also affected by what was going on uh, in Syria. So, so my book is the story of this mutual transformation mm -hmm. of Turkey and, and Syria after the conflict in Syria started. And I know you just started, but um, where could people look out for that um, once it is um, finished with? Well, my, my publisher is uh, Oxford University Press, mm -hmm, awesome. so I'm, I'm hoping to finish um, everything by the end of the year.
Awesome. This is really exciting. Well, um, Dr. Toll, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today, and we thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences with us. If you want to learn more about today's guest, our mission, or our program, you can visit us at the PMBF website or go follow any of our social media pages. For the Middle East and South Asia initi uh, Initiative Program here at UCF, this is Roxanne Trevetta. Thank you for listening. <laughs>